And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, The Whistler's Strange Story. Episode at Thunder Mountain. Moving down the icy slopes of Thunder Mountain, the young couple on skis could scarcely be aware of the fact that their downhill progress was being observed through the telescopic sights of a high-powered rifle from the ridge above. And then as they pulled up to a stop behind a protective screen of tall fir trees, Paul Cameron caught his attractive partner in his arms. <laughs> oh, you had fun, darling. Of course. Oh, no. I've had a wonderful afternoon, Paul. So have I. Come here. Paul. Paul, darling. Will I see you tomorrow, Helen? Yes. Same place. Yes. I... I'd better go now. Oh, so soon? I must, darling. It'll be dark before long. (laughs) All right. I'll wait here till you reach the lodge before starting down. Till tomorrow, Paul. Bye. A lovely, exciting girl, isn't she, Paul? Helen Whiteside, the young woman you've chosen to be the next Mrs. Cameron. You stand there puffing slowly on a cigarette and watch as Helen races down the slope. Then she's gone from sight. You wait another few minutes until you're certain she's reached the bottom of the slide. And then step out from behind the trees. And as you do, the bullet ricochets off the tree above you and then another. You leap forward, hurl yourself down the slope, racing faster and faster over a sea of white, swerving and twisting crazily. And around you, one bullet after another kicks up a tiny cloud of snow. Hello, Mr. Cameron. What'll it be? Uh, uh, scotch, as usual. A uh, uh, double. Right. Oh, uh, by the way... Uh, yeah? Your wife was in looking for you. Oh? She was? She was here a couple of minutes ago. Thinks she went to make a phone call. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, hurry it up with that drink, will you, please? Sure thing. Uh, how was skiing today, Mr. Cameron? Uh, Mr. Cameron? Uh, uh, what? How was skiing? Oh. Oh, it's all right. You know, I just don't see what kind of kick you fellas get out of sliding down them hills like that. Here you are, Mr. Cameron. Uh, thanks. Oh, Paul. Paul, darling. Oh, oh Sandra. Um, I'll have one of those too, Joseph. Okay, Miss Cameron. Oh, Paul, I, I mm-hmm. just called the Frasers. They can come. Oh, uh, really? Mm-hmm. And the Mortons, too. They weren't doing a thing. And, uh, uh, apparently we are, huh? Of course, darling. I'm giving a little dinner party at the lodge for... Oh, 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 I didn't tell you. <laughs> no, 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 you didn't. Well, guess who dropped in on us? He's going to stay for the entire weekend. Your brother, Nicky. Well, that's right. How'd you guess? Oh, it's just a hunch, Sandra. Yeah, I had a feeling today that my dear brother-in-law was around, close by. <laughs> Uh, 
Yes, Paul. From the moment that first bullet whistled over your head on the ski slope this afternoon, you knew that Nicky was in the vicinity, didn't you? That he was the one who had tried to kill you. His second attempt in as many months, Paul. Each of them unsuccessful. But you know you've got to do something about it before your luck changes. That evening at the dinner party for your wife's friends, Nicky is his usual charming self, dominating the gay, light-hearted conversation. And finally, the two of you meet alone on the terrace overlooking the valley. Surprised to see me, Paul? No, Nicky. Can't say that I am. I rather expected you'd show up. Oh, hope you don't mind. Should I? Well, after all, to have one's brother-in-law come barging in this way, it seems I've been popping in on you and Senator quite frequently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, cigarette? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the truth of the matter is, Paul, I, um... I worry a lot oh. about Sandra, I mean. Why should you? Well, things are always happening to Sandra. Accidents, sorts. Like last week. A car crash? Well, you can hardly blame her for that. Something went wrong with the steering gear. As I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there have been other things. For example, the time the sun lamp fell into that tub of water. He could have been electrocuted. Oh, yes. Yeah. I just can't bear the thought of anything happening to Sandra. Oh, I, I quite understand. As you said, Nicky, you're very fond of her. Yes, I am. And, of course, Sandra is a very wealthy woman. Oh, we're both well aware of that fact, aren't we, Paul? Her first husband was a fine fellow. It was rather decent of him to leave her all that money, too, wasn't it? <laughs> it was quite a break for you. Uh. Oh, can I help with it? Sandra's a very generous woman. After all, I am her brother. Uh, all of which entitles you to a very substantial allowance every month. Oh, you've tried time and time again to talk her out of it, too, haven't you? I'll be ridiculous. Oh, but you have. The more she spends on Brother Nicky, the less remains in... Uh, Kitty, so to speak. Oh, it'd be absurd. Oh, I know you married Sandra for her money. Nothing else, Paul. You just can't stand to see any of it being uh, squandered on Brother Nicky. Now, look, Nicky... I suppose uh, you're going to tell me you're madly in love with Sandra. Huh? Why should I tell you anything? You don't have to. You're in love with Helen Whiteside. You see, I know all about Helen. Now, don't bother to deny it, old man. I'm well aware of what's been going on between you and that little redhead. I have been for some time. Then, uh... Why haven't you told Sandra? Oh, no, 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 Paul. I'm not a complete fool. Well, Sandra's fond of me, it's true, but she happens to be head over heels in love with you, and if I dared suggest that you were two-timing her, well, she'd probably check me out on my ear, and there would go my lovely little allowance. Suppose I were to tell Sandra that you had tried to kill me on two different occasions. I try um, to kill you? Oh, that's crazy. Oh, no, no, it's not. The first time... You, when... you can prove... I tried to kill you? No. No, but I know you did. Suppose I told Sandra that, Nicky. Oh, she wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Not dear sweet brother Nicky. Oh, no, no. As a matter of fact, she might become quite angry with you, old man. I, I, I think I will tell her. I know you won't. Oh. No, Paul, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave Sandra out of it. And just settle things between the two of us. All right, Nicky. We'll do as you say. Settle things just between the two of us. Last Tuesday, on New Year's Day, practically all cars aged a whole year. Yep, even those shiny 1951s are now last year's models. But the important thing is not a car's age, but how well it runs. Why, many of you who own vintage models are today enjoying better performance than you did a year or five years ago. You are if you're powering your car with Signal Ethyl, a premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. After all, Signal Ethyl is engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. And when I say best, I mean best starting, trigger quick on cold mornings. I mean best pickup that apologizes to no one when the traffic light says go. And I mean best power that hoists you smoothly over our king-size western hills in high. Who worries what year a car was made when you're enjoying driving like that? And you can enjoy it if you just head for a signal station. 
See if your car doesn't feel younger, much younger, when you treat it to a tank full of Signal Ethel. It's out in the open now, isn't it, Paul? The duel between you and Sandra's brother, Nicky. A duel you're sure can only end in death for one of you. Nicky's well aware of what you've been up to, isn't he? Yes. He's certain you've tried to kill Sandra, inherit her money, and marry Helen Whiteside. And you know he's going to try to prevent that. Because as long as his sister remains alive, he can count on a very handsome allowance from her each month. It's either you or Nicky, isn't it, Paul? But just how you're going to rid yourself of Nicky isn't quite clear to you yet. But late the following afternoon, as you're sitting alone at the lodge, before the huge fireplace sipping a drink, your wife, Sandra, comes in. Who is that you're talking to outside, Sandra? Uh, Mr. Savelli. You know he's one of the ranchers in the valley, also a deputy sheriff. Oh, is that so? Well, what did he want? Nothing in particular. He and his men were just passing by. They've been trying to track down some mountain lions. Had an awful lot of trouble with them lately. Attacking the flocks and so on. Oh, oh, I see. And you know, Paul... Oh, oh uh... Smooth over, darling. Oh, okay. Um, I've had the most wonderful idea. Uh, we could organize a hunt. and get all our friends here together and hunt my mountain lion. We could all meet here early in the morning and have a big breakfast and then join Mr. Savilli and the other ranchers. Say, that's not a bad idea. Even stay overnight if we wish. Yeah, he tells me there's some old abandoned cabins up on one of the ridges. Huh. They're using them as headquarters. Well, do you, you suppose the Frasers would come along? Oh, I know they would. Yeah. The Fenways. Yeah, the Fenways. Marge and Jim Morton, too. So, well, wait a minute. How about your brother? How about Nicky? Do you suppose he'd like to join the hunt? Of course, he'd love it. How nice of you to think of him, Paul. Oh, <laughs> not at all, dear. And I, I think we should start getting things organized. Right away. It's perfect, isn't it, Paul? If only Nicky, Sandra's brother, will agree to go along. And you're very pleased when you learn that he has agreed at Sandra's insistence. And as the plans for the hunt begin to take place, you find time to steal a few moments with Helen Whiteside again. It's a guarded conversation in the main lodge. As you sit down near her, pretend to be reading a magazine. We shouldn't be talking here, Paul. Never mind. Just pick up that paper. They won't even notice it. Helen, I can't meet you tomorrow. I'm going to leave the lodge for a day or so and going along on this hunt they're organizing. Doesn't matter, Paul. What? I said it doesn't matter. I've been thinking this over. You and me. It isn't going to work. What are you talking about? I'm not content. Seeing moments together like this. It isn't fair to any of us. Me, you, my wife. Helen, listen to me. No, No, wait Someone's looking this way. Now, listen, Paul, Helen. you listen. I'm leaving the lodge in the morning. I'm going back to town. Oh, Helen, please. Paul, it's perfectly obvious that, well, that you're not going to be able to do anything about, about Sandra. Helen, that isn't true. Oh? No, please, please, just give me a little time. Will Paul, you? I... Don't, don't ask me to explain anything. It's just that I'm... Well, I'm, I'm quite certain that things are going to be different. Soon, Helen. Very soon. Yes, Paul, you do feel certain that the time has come. And Helen's attitude convinces you of another thing. The schedule for disposing of your wife, Sandra, must be moved up, too. That night, the plan begins to take shape in your mind. It's pretty well in focus, isn't it? As you join the others at breakfast early in the morning and... Prepare to set forth on the pack trip up into the lonely reaches of the mountain. You have a heavy hunting rifle with an easy reach on one of the pack mules. Nicky has one, too. But no one in the gay, light-hearted party realizes what each of you has in mind. Nicky makes it clear to you at one of the stops along the winding, arduous trail. He waits until you're alone and slips up beside you. Quite a setting for the last act, that's all. What are you talking about? Oh, stop it, old man. I think I haven't noticed the way you keep buying that hunting rifle. 
Just itching to grab it, huh? Blast my head off? You're out of your mind. I'm not that much of a fool with all these people along. Oh, well, that'll be a later time. That problem we split up for the hunt, maybe tomorrow? Huh? Yes, that, that might be ideal. Look, look, this Sir Villy, he's a deputy sheriff, you know. He's a good witness to the little accident. Nothing like having the law on you, sir. I'll tell you, you better not try anything. Is this a truce, officer? Or just something to throw me off my guard? <laughs> oh, all right, Paul. I believe you for the next 12 hours anyway, huh? Because you really wouldn't try anything in a big group like this, huh? Ah, but tomorrow... Much as I'd relish it, Nicky, I have no such plans for you. <laughs> well, we'll see. Right now, I must see to the needs of our mutual benefactor. My dear sister, Sandra. Ta-ta, old man. All right, folks, we'll have to hit the trail again. Oh, Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> It's frightening, isn't it, Paul? Nicky's cold, self-assured approach. And the terrible realization that he's a much better marksman than you. But you have a plan. Hours later, as the pack train finally arrives at the Lonely Ridge, in the tiny group of cabins, you feel quite certain that everything is perfect for your plan. There's just one thing to do, isn't there? One idea to be planted to make your story airtight later on. You attend to it as the group breaks up to take over the cabins for the night. Oh, uh, Jim. Hey, Jim, Jim Morton. Huh? Jim, come here, oh, will you? Oh, yes, Paul. Uh, what is it? Well, I just wanted to ask a little favor of you. Um, uh, would you and Marge take the cabin next to ours? <laughs> oh, sure. I'll see what difference it makes. They all look pretty much run down. No, well, no, it isn't that, Jim. It's, uh, <laughs> well, frankly, uh, I-, I don't want Sandra's brother, Nicky, so close to us. Oh, oh, look, I, I know how it must sound, and I hope you won't say anything. Well, of course not. But Nikki but... and Sandra had a big blow-off back at the lodge yesterday. Well, it was about money. So look, like you that. don't have to tell me. Well, thanks, I know that. You're a good friend, Jim, to Sandra and to me. Well, actually, I may be just imagining things, but... Uh, this Nikki is a strange chap. And I'm afraid for Sandra. It's better to play no, safe anyway. Understand. You know. We'll be right there. Good. Matter of fact, it looks as if he's taking the cabin that's farthest away. Huh? Oh, well, that's good. Well, it's like I said, maybe nothing to it. <laughs> Just forget about it, will you, Jim, that I ever said anything? Sure thing. And now I'd better give Marge a hand with the sleeping bag. Yeah, I'll go on. I'll do the same thing. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks a lot. Just a few words, Paul. Something that Jim will forget for the moment. But something he's sure to remember when you need him most. When the rest of your plan is carried out. The next step is a simple one, isn't it, Paul? The window inside the cabin you share with Sandra. She pays no attention as you check it casually, see that it can be raised. It can. You close it again. That's all for now, isn't it, Paul? But a few hours later at dinner with the others around a big campfire, you're very attentive to Sandra and notice with pleasure that Jim Morton keeps watching her brother, Nicky. It's all going together perfectly, isn't it? An hour or so later, Mr. Servilli suggests that everyone turn in, get a good night's rest. And they all agree. Later in the cabin, you pace the floor as Sandra stirs restlessly in bed. Paul, why are you pacing? Aren't you going to sleep? Uh, no, no, not right away, Sandra. Have all the others turned in? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Bonfire was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all right. Paul, hmm? is something bothering you? You've been very quiet ever since we left the lodge. No, it's nothing. Um, I'm going outside, Sandra. I have another cigarette before I turn in. Well, don't wander far. Mr. Savilli said the cliff in back of our cabin is quite dangerous. Yeah, I, I know all about the cliff, Sandra. Drop of several hundred feet. Well, I'm not thinking of jumping off yet, you oh, know. Paul, please, that isn't funny. You're not... You're not really happy with me, are but you? Let's not discuss it at this hour, Sandra. I'm... I know. You're tired. You're tired of me, of everything. Something else my money couldn't really buy. All right, Paul. This time, when we get back, we'll... We'll call it quits. What? No, no, wait a minute, Sam. Good night, Paul. Like you, I, I'm too tired to discuss Oh, it. but Sam... All right, go on to sleep. I'll be back soon. <laughs> If you needed any further urging, Sandra has provided it, hasn't she, Paul? Suggesting that the two of you can call it quits, as she puts it. But that wouldn't be enough, would it? Helen is expensive. 
Sandra's money is very necessary. Yes. And everything is clear and simple now. As you walk quietly to the far end of the row of quiet cabins. And knock softly on the door of the last one. Who is it? It's me, Nicky. Uh, Paul. Open up. What do you want? It isn't what I want. It's Sandra. She wants to talk to you. Now? Uh-huh, now. Well, now, just don't worry. I'm not armed. <laughs> this still isn't the time or the place. Why, did, why does she want to see me? What, what have you told her? Everything, my dear brother-in-law. You're a fool, Paul! Perhaps. Perhaps not. Well, you shouldn't keep Sandra waiting. She's quite annoyed with you. Uh, well, wait till I get a coat. Some boots. Yeah, and your rifle, Nicky, you better bring it along in case you have any doubts uh, about me. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> I thought you'd agree. see any light in the cabin. Are you sure, Sam? Well, look closer, Nicky. There's a light. He turns, peers through the darkness toward the cabin. And in that moment, your hand closes around a heavy rock in your overcoat pocket. You lift the rock high. I'm sorry, Nicky. <sighs> this is as far as you go. Quickly, you lift Nicky's limp form, carry him to the edge of the cliff and back of the cabin. A little shove in the first half of your plan is complete, isn't it, Paul? But only the first half. You hurry back to the spot where you killed Nicky, don a pair of leather gloves, pick up Nicky's rifle, and enter your cabin. You freeze for a moment as Sandra stirs uneasily in her sleep. Then you undress quickly, slipping into your pajamas and robe. You cross the room. Stand near the window as you raise Nicky's heavy hunting rifle. And then... A moment later, you're across the cabin and outside. You hurl the rifle out into the snow and then shout at the top of your lungs... Jim! Jim Morton! Mr. Savelli! Help! Help somebody! Come quick! Help! 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 Please... Please, can't you do something for her, for Sandra? Now, Sandra, easy, you... son, easy. It's yeah, too but... late to do anything. Now, try to tell us again <laughs> what happened. Go slowly. Well, Nicky. Nicky and Sandra, they had a terrible row yesterday back at the lodge. That's right. Paul told me about it this afternoon. I had no idea he'd do anything like this. And he... Well, he came down here. He tried to get in. He wouldn't open the door. I thought he'd gone away. But he, he went to the window, you said. Yeah, that's, that's right. He raised it and fired point blank at her, and then he ran. And I went out after him, caught him for a second. He struggled over the gun. He let go of it and broke away. Oh, he didn't know where he oh, was Oh, I don't know. Maybe he didn't care by then. He, he, he just went right over the cliff. That's a two or three hundred foot fall. Yeah. Probably just as well. He'd never have got away with it. Poor Sandra. Now, I should have told you about the quarrel. Easy, Paul. It wasn't your fault. No. Uh, I've seen things like this before, Mr. Cameron. Well, it gets crazy mad like that. Uh, maybe he'd even been drinking. We don't know. Yeah, but if I hadn't let Nicky come along... Don't he'd you have found that? another way, probably. Nothing to blame yourself for, Mr. Cameron. Not much use blaming anybody now. Did you know that right now, during the rainy season, scientific lubrication is even more important to your car to keep moisture from working into vital moving parts and causing expensive damage? That's why I think you'll be interested in knowing about some of the extras you enjoy when you have your car lubricated at a signal service station. First of all, signal dealers take no chances on memory when it comes to the many lubrication points on your car. Instead, they check against Signal's factory-recommended lubrication chart, which clearly shows every part. Then they use nine specialized Signal oils and greases, so each part will get the exact type of protection it needs. And finally, just to make doubly sure not a single part is ever overlooked, they check each part again, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. Now, that's the kind of lube job you want if your car is to give you the long, trouble-free service that was built into it. And that's the kind of lubrication you get at friendly, independently operated signal service stations. (laughs) 
Well, Paul, it's all over, isn't it? And in a way that you're certain leaves you in the clear. It's simple, isn't it? So simple that even the slow-thinking sheriff's deputy, Mr. Servilli, can have no difficulty in adding things up. You're sure he will have to reach the inevitable conclusion that Nicky killed his sister out of frustration when she threatened to cut him off without a cent. You stand just outside the cabin now, the stunned, grief-stricken husband dully recounting your story to the little group of Sandra's friends as inside, Mr. Servilli examines the position of the body, the cabin, and then finally comes to the open door and calls to you. Uh, Mr. Cameron, hmm? would you step in here for a moment? Oh, yeah, yes, of course. It's all right. I've covered her. Thanks. Skip it. It was out of respect to her. Not you, Cameron. What? It was an interesting yarn you told out there in front of all those people. Yarn? I see here, Mr. Savilli. You said uh, Nicky came to the cabin a little while ago. That you wouldn't unlock the door for him. You said he raised the window. Fired point blank at it. Thoughtful of him to close the window after he shot her, wasn't it? No, no, no. I closed the... I thought she might still be alive, and I didn't want to take any chance on her you getting killed. You made up quite a story, Cameron. But it's not going to help you. You shot your wife. Oh, now, look here, Sir Billy. I, I won't stand here and be accused by an amateur detective who thinks he can Save it, Cameron. Me. And listen. You see, these cabins aren't used much. You should have thought of that because this window hasn't been raised in the last three hours. Maybe you raised it before then to check it. I, I don't know. But I do know it hasn't been raised in the last three hours. Well, it was, I tell you. Come here, Cameron. Have a closer look. What? Here. Along the bottom of the sack. <sighs> Spider web. Yes. Spun by one of the more permanent residents of this old cabin. He's been busy for at least three hours. Takes these spiders up here that long to spin a web. Uh, uh, spider. A little thing like a spider. A very busy little spider. I'd say the web he spun between this sill and window sash provides enough evidence for even an amateur detective to make an arrest. Wouldn't you? Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. To men over 17, the National Guard suggests you find out how you can meet your military obligations this pleasant way. Train with your hometown buddies, learn new skills, and enjoy sports while you live at home and get a day's regular pay for each two-hour drill period. For more information, inquire at nearest National Guard headquarters. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, John Daner, Sarah Selby, Virginia Gregg, Lamont Johnson, Don Harvey, and Britt Wood. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler entitled Man from the Morgue in which a strange deception leads a frightened criminal to frenzied action and murder. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>